Make it go fast. I have up here the biblical testimony. I'm getting an echo. Are you hearing this? I have up here the biblical testimony, and then I have the features, the fulfillment, and the functions of the Abrahamic Covenant redemptive history. I'm expecting, I just put these three things on here so you can see the big picture. I'm expecting that when this board gets full, I'm going to erase it, and functions and redemptive history is going to be one big board that's going to take up a board, maybe two boards, by the time we get it done. So the features first of the Abrahamic Covenant built on the testimony. This is one of the things where you bootstrap your way up. I never know whether I should do it deductively or inductively. If I do it inductively, we look at all the texts, and then we come back and we fill in these things. If we do it deductively, I give you these categories, and then we look up a passage to support each category. People usually like the inductive method better, but it takes more time. Well, let's do it. Let's go. We'll do as much inductive as we can. Genesis chapter 12. Here are the, there are four key passages, the four foundational passages in which this covenant is revealed implicitly and explicitly to Abraham himself in his life. Then there are two other passages in which it's oh, at least one passage where it's explicitly revealed to Isaac, which is in Genesis 26, 3 and 4, and then several passages where it's revealed to Jacob. So first of all, you have Abraham. And the four key passages for the Abrahamic covenant are Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and Genesis 22. And these four passages all have to do with Abraham's life and the revelation of this covenant to Abraham in the period of his life. Then you have it revealed to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26 and then revealed to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28 verses 13 and 14, and other passages, Genesis 35, 9 to 12, Genesis 48, 4 to 9. Now, obviously, I can't go to all of them. But let's, first of all, we look at Abraham and how this covenant is revealed to Abraham. First of all, implicitly, in that there's no mention of covenant in this passage. It's implicit here, but the language of this passage is taken up into an explicit use of covenant in Acts 3.25 and Genesis 22.18. The beginning and the end of the revelation of these dealings of God with Abraham has to do with this particular promise. See if you could tell what that promise is. The, the very same promise of Genesis 22 and the very same promise of Genesis 12. See if you can find what it is. Genesis 12, chapter 1. And the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house into the land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and be thou a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and him that curses thee will I curse and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. You don't have any mention of covenant in that passage. Genesis 15. And we read in verse 18 of Genesis 15. In that day, Jehovah made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the river of Egypt... Unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And then it names the peoples that were then dwelling in that land. Kenite, Kenizzite, Kadmonite, Hittite, Perizzite, Rephaim, Amorite, Canaanite, Gergashite, Jebusite. Now that's the first explicit mention in scripture of a covenant with Abraham. The next passage is in Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Let's turn to Genesis 17. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be there thou perfect. And I will make my covenant. Now again, see the same kind of language, my solemn pledge. My covenant between me and you, my, my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face 
And God talked with him saying, as for me, my covenant, my solemn pledge is with you, singular, and you, Abraham, singular, Abram, singular, shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Neither shall your name be called any more Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for the father of a multitude of nations have I made you, and I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of you, singular, and kings will come out of you, singular, Abram, who is going to be called Abraham. So verses 3 through 6 focus on Abram, Abraham, personally, singularly, and individually. Next part of these covenantal dealings broadens the scope. Verse 7. And in addition to this, and in addition, and furthermore, and I will make you, I'm sorry, and I will establish my solemn pledge between me and you, Abraham, and your seed, your posterity after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your posterity after you. And I will give to you and to your seed, your posterity after you, the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That's a second dimension of what is promised to Abraham. The first part has to do with Abraham, and it focuses on him alone, the change of his name, etc. And is, is different, his new identity. The second part has to do with him and his posterity. But now consider the third dimension of these covenantal dealings. And it says, And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your posterity, your seed, after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep. Now notice, this is my covenant which you shall keep. Between me and you and your seed after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and you, plural. And then it goes on to describe the relevance of that that of circumcision in verse 14. So that's the first, that's the next passage. The two key passages then were explicitly covenant with Abraham as mentioned are Genesis 15, Genesis 17. But there's another important passage and that's Genesis 22 in terms of dealings with Abraham. In Genesis 22, verse 16 to 18. Genesis 22:16 16 to 18. This is upon the occasion of the offering up of Isaac. In Genesis 22, 16 to 18, By myself have I sworn, God said, by myself I have sworn, by myself. Notice that language. I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed, your posterity, as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is upon the gate of the seashore, which is upon the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, do you notice what the promise is with which this whole series of covenantal dealings with Abraham begins and ends? It begins in Genesis 12. It ends in Genesis 22. You know what that promise is? It's in Genesis 12 and 22. It's not mentioned in Genesis 15 or 17, but it's mentioned in Genesis 12 and Genesis 22. What, what is that? What about the seed? 
Seed singular. What about the seed singular? All the nations will be blessed in Abraham's seed. That's right. In Genesis 12, it starts with Abraham. And it says, in you, Abraham, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And in Genesis 22, it says, and in your seed, singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. All the families of the earth blessed in Abraham's seed. All the families of the earth blessed in Abraham. That is the beginning and the end. That is what sandwiches everything else that's found in the Abrahamic covenant. That is a crucial, significant promise. It's the first and the last. Now, what is the the substance of this covenant? And let's go through these texts. Let's look at Genesis chapter 15 first. Then we'll look at Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 20. Verse 18 says, In that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land. Now, first of all, a covenant is made verbally. A covenant is made historically. It says, In that day. This covenant between God and Abraham was not made in eternity. This covenant was not made in the Garden of Eden. This covenant was made in Abraham's life. It was made on that day. It says, in that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying. Notice the content or substance of this covenant. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thee thy seed, Have I given this land? So one thing is abundantly clear. I'm going to put down the partaker of this covenant is Abraham. And the promise of this covenant as revealed in Genesis 15 is that his posterity will inherit the land of Canaan. Now, can there be any doubt that that's what that says. In that day, Jehovah made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land. Then he identifies whose land it was, and he identifies the people who would be dispossessed when this land was given to the posterity of Abraham, from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Now are some what you could call trappings of this covenantal dealing that are difficult to grasp. There are some peripheral issues in the context. Verse 8 says that he says to the Lord, whereby will I know that I will inherit it? And verse 9 says, take a heifer three years old and a she-goat three years old and a ram three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He took them and divided them in the midst and the birds came and Then we read verse 12, and the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell on Abraham and a horror of great darkness. And he said, Abraham, know of a surety that your seed shall be sojourners in a land not theirs and serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also then I'll judge that nation and they'll come out with great substance and you'll go to your fathers in peace and you'll be buried in a good old age. And in the fourth generation, they'll come here again because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. So in conjunction with Abraham making this oath-bound, God making this oath-bound promise to Abraham, there's this very, what seems to us, strange ceremony of cutting animals in pieces. And along with it comes a prophecy. And this prophecy describes the manner in which this promise will be fulfilled. So it's ratified with a ceremony. It's ratified in history. It's ratified in prophecy. With a prophecy, with a ceremony in history, it's ratified. Not an eternity in history. With a ceremony, with prophecy. Now this ceremony, this ceremony is associated with underscoring the absolute certainty of what God pledged to Abraham. Now it may be odd to us and strange to us, but there is a passage that sheds further light on this very strange thing. 
about the flaming torch passing through the pieces. Verse 17. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a flaming torch that passed between these pieces. In that day, the Lord made a covenant. There's a flaming torch passing through cut pieces of animals and that ceremony is associated with making a covenant. Now, there are different uh, theologians or exegetes or students of biblical theology who have attempted to give different uh, explanations of this. Now, I won't be dogmatic about it, but there is a passage that explains this ceremony. It's in Jeremiah 34, 18. And it says that they made a covenant when they passed through the pieces of the calf. Apparently, this ceremony was used in sometimes in the making of covenants. Not always. I don't know that in the Noahic covenant anything passed through the pieces of the calf. But in the Abrahamic covenant, and in this passage in Jeremiah, there's a Jeremiah 34, 18, there's, it indicates the making of this covenant through the passing of the pieces of a calf. Some people say it's a, a self-maledictory oath. If I break my word, let me die too. I'm not sure whether that's true or not. I don't know. But I just I simply know this. That ceremony is associated with it's a ceremony associated with making a covenant formally in some cases. And in this case, it is. And Jeremiah 34, 18 makes that clear. It's in history in that day. It's in prophecy about how it will be fulfilled. And that prophecy is given in verses 12 uh, through 16. And the ceremony is in verse 17, and in that day is verse 18. So that's what you can find out about this Abrahamic covenant. It's put in force or ratified by ceremony with a prophecy, and at that point in history. Okay? There's the partaker, and that's the promise. Clear? Yes? Good. Genesis 17. Let's move on. Genesis 17. So we combine, you see, the inductive and the deductive method in an an event to save time. Abraham was 99 years old. And God says, walk before me and be perfect. And verse 2 says, I will make my covenant between me and you, Abraham, And I will multiply you exceedingly. Now, it's interesting. I think it's very significant that here in verses 2 to 6, in verses 2 to 6, these are promises. And I put this promise first. I put this promise, though it was mentioned first in history, I put it second. There's another promise that I'm going to put third. But I put this promise first here. I put it first because of the singular use in Genesis 17. Two through six. I put it first. Why do I put it first? I put it first because it has special reference to Abraham himself personally. As I'll show you later, promises number two and three, which we're about to discover inductively, are both repeated to Isaac and Jacob. But this promise is just for Abraham. And it gives Abraham his unique identity and role in redemptive history. This gives Abraham his unique identity and role in redemptive history because it's in virtue of this promise that he has his name given to him. This promise is especially bound up with his personal identity. And what is this promise? What is this promise that makes Abraham uniquely Abraham? It changes the man from being an Avram to being who he uniquely is. In redemptive history, he is Abraham. What is the promise that makes him who he is? Right. The father of what? Many nations. Absolutely right. He is the father of a multitude of nations. I have no longer called you Avram. I've called you Avraham because you are the father of a multitude of nations. And every one of those verses emphasizes the singular, the you singular, and it's a change of his name. 
So even though it's not mentioned first in history, this is first mentioned in Genesis 15. Okay, this is significant, first in significance, because it's first in Genesis 17, which is the most complete revelation, and it's also first in uh, in having him singular identified with it. So again, the partaker underscore Abraham. You have Abraham, Genesis 15, Abraham, check, Genesis 17. That's two texts. Okay, now... Let's look at the the next promise. What's the next promise? The next promise is found in 17, 7 through 8. This is Genesis 17, 7 and 8. And what's the promise here? And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations to be a God to you and to your seed after you And I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. What's the promise there? Right? Twofold, right, Jamie? The first part is land of Canaan, and the second part is? Well, relationship. Well said. And what is the relationship? They will be the people of God. They will be God's special people, right? Yes. They will be the people of God. Right. Absolutely right. They will be the people of God and they will inherit the land. And those two things are closely connected together, as we shall see in the fulfillment of this promise in redemptive history. When they become the people of God, they inherit the land. You'll see. And now there is, that's it. Those are the promises, right? That, That covers it. That's all that's there. Agreed? The next thing is the token. And the token is found in verses 9 9 to 14. 17, 9 to 14. And what what does the token of the Abrahamic covenant consist in? What is it? Everybody? Right. Exactly right. Circumcision is the token of the Abrahamic covenant. So look what we've got so far. We got Abraham. Oh, now we have other we have other partakers too, don't we? We have his posterity. That's right. Can't leave that out. Seventeen, seven, and eight. Abraham and his posterity. Right. The promise is. To Abraham, that he will be the father of a multitude of nations. And to Abraham and to his posterity, that they will be the people of God and inherit the land of Canaan. Yes? Okay. All right, Genesis chapter 22 comes next. Verse 17 and 18 says, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand is upon the seashore, and your seed will possess the gate of his enemies and in your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, first of all, is the word covenant used in the text? Right, no. So how can you say that this is covenant? Is there anything in the text, if you understand this text when you read it, what covenant is, is there anywhere in this text that indicates that it is a covenant and how do you recognize it as a covenant, though the word is not explicitly used? That's correct. Absolutely. I have sworn. And furthermore, 
Is there anywhere else in the script? First of all, does everybody understand what he just said, why that's right? You understand why that's correct? Okay. This is an oath-bound promise of favor and blessing. That is a covenant. Even though the word is not explicitly used, that's what it is. That's why it's appropriate to call it covenant. Is there anywhere else in the Bible where the Bible reflects back on this verse and says that this indeed is a covenant with Abraham? Yes, I agree with you, but there's one passage that's even more explicit than that. We'll get to Galatians 3 in a minute. There's one passage even more explicit than Galatians 3, although I agree with you that is what Galatians 3 is talking about. Okay, here's what it is. Acts, turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 3. Crucial text, crucial text. Acts chapter 3. You couldn't ask for anything more explicit. God doesn't leave us to speculate about something so important as the promise which ties together all of redemptive history. God gives it to us in very plain English or Greek or Hebrew or whatever. (laughs) And he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 25 and 26, he says to them, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Can there be any doubt? Right? Acts 3.25 and 6 shows you very clearly, By myself have I sworn... The Bible reflects back on this and its inspired interpretation is this is covenant with Abraham. This very phrase, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is a covenant with Abraham. This is part of the covenant with Abraham. The final promise of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, what is the substance of that promise? What is being promised? Let's look at Genesis 22. What, is, what exactly is he promising him? What did he promise him? You got real clear what he promised him here. People of God, land of Canaan, father of many nations. What is this promise saying? What is it saying, Genesis 22? What is he promising? Correct. Okay, so let's see. How about worldwide... Blessing through Abraham's heir. Okay, how's that? Is that good? Can you live with that? All right, what kind of blessing is this that it's talking about? Because you find... The very same type of statement was made in Genesis 12 through Abraham. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Remember that? Remember that statement that we read in Genesis 12? Now, what kind of blessing is this? Is there anywhere? Now we're going to go to Galatians 3. Yes, it is. And this is where Galatians chapter 3 is very important that we understand what this is talking about. You see, I don't want to get ahead of myself and talk about the fulfillment at this point. I'm just trying to explain the meaning of the promise. I'm not getting into how it's fulfilled, but there's no way I can explain the meaning of the promise without going into the inspired interpretation of these promises. So I don't feel like I'm being guilty of getting ahead of myself. Um, Verse 7 of Galatians 3, Know therefore that they that are sons of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then, they that are of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. That thing about, that statement about being blessed in thee, 
has to do with spiritual blessing, and in this case, blessing the Gentiles by faith. If you look back in the one we looked at, Acts 3, 25 and 26, it says, God, in verse 26, having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to bless you. There's the blessing. How? In turning every one of you away from your iniquities. So this is worldwide gospel blessing. And I'll just leave it at that. Worldwide gospel blessing through Abraham's heir, Abraham's seed. Genesis 12, 3, and Galatians 3, 7, and 8, and Acts 3, 25, and Acts 3, 26, makes very clear that this is a promise about worldwide gospel blessing through Abraham's heir or seed, which is the Messiah, the anointed one. And how do I know it's the anointed one? Because in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14, we read this, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, that upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, the blessing of Abraham that comes to us in Christ, in Abraham's seed, in thy seed, in Messiah, in Christ, is what? The promise of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ bestows is the blessing. So this blessing has to do with the righteousness of Christ. This blessing has to do with the Spirit of Christ. This blessing has to do with the gospel of Christ. This is the spiritual blessing. The gospel of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, justified by faith, the Spirit of Christ, that in the Gentiles might receive the blessing of Abraham in thee, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Preach the gospel to Abraham, saying. These passages are clear, brethren. This is gospel. This is the gospel promised to Abraham. This is Christ, the Messiah, the spirit of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, the blessing of all the families of the earth in Christ. This is what's promised in Genesis 22 and in Genesis 12. You see it there? You see? No, I'm not going to I'm not speaking now yet about how it's fulfilled, but can there be any doubt that in this Abrahamic covenant there is gospel promise made to Abraham? Can there be any such doubt? So there are as I read these passages, brethren, and apparently as you read them too, because you saw these things in there, there are three promises. The promise made to Abraham himself, by which he gets his name Abraham, is he's the father of a multitude of nations, and he assumes his unique role in redemptive history in virtue of this. Then you have his posterity becoming the people of God and inheriting the land of Canaan. Then you have his heir, Messiah, bringing worldwide gospel blessing to all the families of the earth, bringing gospel blessing to all the families of the earth. Those are the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12 and Genesis 22 implicitly speak of this one. Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 explicitly speak of these. The central passage and the key passage which gives us most of the information is Genesis 17, which not only underscores these two promises, but also speaks about the token. And yet the ratification is told to us in Genesis 15 with the ceremony and the prophecy about how the land will be given to Abraham's physical posterity. Yes? You see these things? Okay. Well, I just have a couple little pieces to, to fill in then. All right? We look at Genesis 26. Let's look at Genesis chapter 26. We come to the second dimension of revelation concerning this. This has to do with Isaac. Genesis 26 has to do with Isaac. Look at verse 3. Sojourn in this land... 
God speaking to Isaac. God says to him, Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For unto thee, Isaac, and unto thy seed, Isaac, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath which I swear to Abraham thy father. And I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and I will give unto thy seed all these lands and in thy seed shall all the families or nations of the earth be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice. I see two basic promises given to Isaac in that context. Okay? First of all, second person now included in this is Isaac and his posterity, which is Abraham's posterity. Now, that's Genesis 26. What are the two promises made to Isaac, or the two major promises made to Isaac in this context? Which ones? And how do they relate to the promise made with Abraham? Correct. That's right. Promise number two is repeated to Isaac that he would inherit the land in Genesis 26, 3 and 4. And in conjunction with that, his seed would be greatly multiplied. And promise number three, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's also repeated to Isaac in Genesis 26, 3 and 4. Right. I agree. All right. Genesis chapter 28. Jamie. Would not multiplying your offspring be more like Abraham being the father of many nations? Would it not be more of a further expression of that? Well, I think that what it's saying is that, that his, his offspring is going to have a great size. Rather than that, he's going to have the same identity as Abraham is the father of many different nations. That rather it's talking about that his offspring growing to a great large size and innumerable multitude. But I can see why you see a similarity. But uh, let's talk about Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. Verse 13 and 14. This is Jacob's ladder. God speaking to Jacob and Jacob's ladder. And behold, Jehovah stood above it and said, I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon you lie. To you I will give it and to your seed. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth. I think that's similar to what's said to Isaac. He's going to have a, that, that seed which is going to inherit the land is going to be very large and big. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. Colon. Promise number one. Promise number two. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, uh, you see it again? And I see here in Genesis 28, 13, and Genesis 28, 14, I believe. It's 28, 14 is the second part of that. Yeah, well, this is 28, 13, and 14. You find the promise that, again, Jacob's seed will become a great multitude and will inherit the land of Canaan. And you find also that in Jacob's seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, in one sense, therefore, this is the covenant with Abraham. In another sense, therefore, this is the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their posterity. Because the, the promise of inheriting the land is not given to Ishmael, though he's Abraham's seed, and it's not given to Esau. Esau. 
though he's Abraham's seed. It's not given to them that the Christ will come from the seed of Ishmael, nor that the Christ will come from the seed of Esau, nor that the seed of Esau or, e, or, or Ishmael will inherit the land of Canaan. Those promises are not carried on with them, but they're carried on through Isaac and the heir of Abraham and through Jacob, the heir of Isaac. And the story of how Jacob becomes Isaac's heir and Isaac becomes Abraham's heir is quite a remarkable story that's given to us in Genesis. And of course, these promises culminate in their heir to Abraham and his seed that he would be the heir of the world who is Messiah Jesus. The heir of Jacob, Isaac, and him. So this covenant is passed on with all three and this is what I would call the patriarchs. The patriarchs have repeated to them, all three of them, that their posterity will be a large number who will inherit the land and that through their seed, which is Christ, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And both of these promises are made to Isaac and Jacob. But it seems that this first promise, that where which Abraham gets his name, falls on him. And furthermore, it also seems to me that this first promise, which pertains mostly to Abraham, that this first promise is fulfilled also with respect to Esau and Ishmael and in other ways. But we'll see that in a minute. Well, that, as I understand it, it's made with the patriarchs and their, and their heirs, Isaac and Jacob, and with their posterity, and ultimately with their final heir, that is Jesus Christ and through him, this final promise is made to them. That it's in him all the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And those are the promises. Uh, Leviticus 26.42 reflects back on this and basically underscores it. Leviticus 26, talks about punishing them and humbling them. And Genesis 26, 42 summarizes this. Then if their uncircumcised heart be humbled and they accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, while I remember and I will remember the land. The covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has to do with the land. So that, my understanding of the substance, the recipients, the token, and the ratification of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, there are many things we could say about this, and... Uh, many things we could say about the token, things we could say about the ratification, and other things that I won't. Um, it could be a very interesting study. I just want to give the big picture here tonight. So that's how I understand the features of the Abrahamic covenant. Do you have questions about that before we move on? Yes. Um, is there, when he said to Isaac, when he, when he confirmed that covenant with Isaac, he said, because Abraham... Right. Um, That's what he said. Is there is it true we could say in some sense that uniquely uh, Abraham is the, the righteous servant, not that obeys his voice? Yes. In a way that it's not true of Isaac and Jacob. That's clearly that. That's yes. I suppose that's true. Um, he's the he's the principal person here. It starts with him. Uh, all of it pertains to him. They partake in it in as much as they are Abraham's heir. Yes. Yes, Dave? I, I regard it as a picture of Christ. I, I regard it as an instructive 
with respect to the, the nature of the, of the salvation that comes in Christ, that salvation comes in Christ through the obedience of Christ, and it is through Christ's obedience that his posterity receives the, prom- the blessing of God. And Abraham, in that respect, is set up as a picture of Christ. And you learn through the life of Abraham what with, about the work of Christ. That's how I understand it. Isaac also is a picture of Christ. Jacob also is a picture of Christ. I see all three of the patriarchs as picture of Christ. I see Christ in all of it. That he is the, the, the servant of the, of the final servant covenant who fulfills the imagery of all the servants of all those covenants. You already saw the imagery inherent in, 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 the, in Noah was obvious. To me, this is just as obvious. Isaac is the, one, is the servant who is the righteous servant of God who is offered up by his father. And uh, uh, so is Jesus. Jacob is the righteous servant of God who becomes God's chosen nation. And so is who prevails with God and men. And that's his name, Jacob. Israel, you prevail with God and men. It's changed to Israel because he prevailed. He wrestled with God and men and prevailed. So Jesus is God's righteous servant who becomes God's chosen nation. So is Jacob. Abraham is God's righteous servant who, by his obedience, delivers his posterity and brings the blessing of God upon all of his posterity. And so is Jesus. And that, that to me, is, is, is that unique thing about Abraham whereby he... Uh, he pictures Christ and also in that uh, he's the father of a multinational posterity, just like Jesus. Abraham's the father of a multinational posterity who, through his obedience, brings the blessing of God upon all his multinational posterity. So is Jesus Christ, God's righteous servant. So, I, yes, I do see that obedience as significant uh, with respect to Abraham's role as the righteous servant who reflects and displays the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I also see Isaac and Jacob as significant in that regard as well, in their unique identity and place in the covenant with Abraham. Yes? I have a question about the land. That is, you know, just from from listening to this, and, and, you know, I know, I don't know a whole lot about dispensationalism or anything like that, but it looks like from this that uh, Israel belongs where it is. Is that... Uh, in other words, this, this fight over the land over there now, um, would we say that it belongs to the Jews? Um, I really am. If I have time tonight, I'll get into that question. It's a question that comes into um, to my mind when you get into that question. You get into the question of the Abrahamic covenant, the uh, transition from the old to the new covenant, and it's a question that I'll get into later if I get into it. It's something I really don't want to try to get into right now. It is certainly a legitimate question that grows out of this topic and out of this subject. I have no doubt about that. It's just a question of time. If I don't get to it tonight, um, then God willing, I get to it tomorrow night when I deal with the perpetuity and limitation of the old covenant. Okay? It could come up in either place. Right. I just just hold that one in abeyance for a while. So I've I've finished with the uh, with the features. Any more questions about the features? And I, before I come to the fulfillment about how these promises are fulfilled. Now to Abraham and his seed with the promises made.